our final set of notes with emotion, and then we'll move on to stress. We've got to talk about how we experience emotion, um, unconsciously, consciously, and the biological structures involved. And we'll kind of, um, it, it's a rather quick, quick thing here. So how are emotions expressed, which we've talked about, um, but let's, let's kind of get into that a little bit more. Unconsciously, we have a fast response system that relies on deep brain circuitry that operates automatically. Okay, so um, this being linked to implicit memories, as it states in your notes. And I want you to jot down really quickly a reminder about implicit memories as we talked about in Unit 7. This is the unintentional memories that we might not even realize we have. And it acts as an early defense um, that produces emotions to help us get out of dangerous situations. And that we are very receptive to possible threats and therefore they're easier to detect because of the biology that's going on there, which we'll talk about. Um, but again, it relies on deep brain circuitry. So like the near instantaneous fright response to a loud noise in the middle of the night, like it's, it's like our defense mechanism. Uh, without requiring deliberate conscious control, this quick response system can easily learn emotional responses through classical conditioning, but it can be slow to forget. So learn to fear dogs after being bitten can last for a while. And that would be an example of an implicit memory, okay? And that we're slow to kind of lose that fear because it gives us an advantage. Consciously would be linked to explicit memories. Okay, so make a note about explicit memories here. It's the conscious memories of facts or events that we try to actively remember. So it generates emotions at a slower rate, but delivers more complete information to consciousness and that we're more conscious of it, therefore more aware and more able to talk about it. Um, and it relies heavily on the cerebral cortex. So it attaches emotional reactions to concepts and experiences that you find especially interesting, attractive, or even repulsive. And you can outwardly talk about that. Again, it's a higher level of thinking, decisions about emotions, etc. So let's talk about the biological structures involved in, with emotion. And the big one is the limbic system with the amygdala. So what types of emotions are processed here? You should know this. It is um, the more extreme end of fear and aggression, okay? The amygdala is continuously alert for any kind of threat and that you will even pick up subliminal threats, ones that you are not consciously aware of. Your amygdala will pick up on it. Um, and this is contributing to our fight or flight response, which you should have written down. Okay, so the amygdala is kind of what triggers biologically that unconscious alert fight or flight response system, um, like in the middle of the night when there's a loud noise and you aren't even really that conscious yet. The reticular formation, it works with the thalamus and amygdala to monitor incoming info. If a threat is detected, um, it sets responses in motion that arouse the body into action. So you hear the loud noise in the middle of the night, the amygdala picks up the threat, and your reticular formation is like, whoa, get going, buddy. Like, you need to move. So that's what is in charge of getting you moving. Um, so the cascade of responses to arouse the brain, cause the heart to accelerate respiration, increase in muscles to become tense. Um, the cerebral cortex is going to interpret events and associates them with memories and feelings. So the right specializing in negative emotions, left specializing in positive emotions. It's good to know that hemispheric difference um, and that what we have learned can very much contribute to how we react. The autonomic nervous system with sympathetic and parasympathetic, all of this should be just a quick review. But the sympathetic becomes active when one is startled or experience an unpleasant emotion with anger. So that kind of gets you going for fight or flight. And then parasympathetic dominates in pleasant emotions and helping you feel like, man, this is nice. Like I'm in homeostasis. I'm good. Hormones of serotonin. So all of these um, are some of the most important in dealing with emotions. Serotonin with depression epinephrine produced in fear and norepinephrine is more abundant in anger. So how do we experience specific emotions? Izard said that we have 10 basic emotions and yes you need to know those. Joy, 
interest and excitement, surprise, sadness, anger, disgust, contempt, fear, shame, and guilt. And he looked at these through experiencing them. Fears learn through conditioning and observation. So we make associate or associating emotions with specific situations like, OMG, there's a spider, I'm in fear. But then an observation, like let's say like the spider bit you, that will condition you to not like spiders. Watching others display fear in response to like a spider, right? That's gonna then make you scared through observation. The biology of fear, we're biologically predisposed to learn to fear particular items because the fear response helps us survive. And we've talked about this before, but an example um, with monkeys, their number one predator is snakes. They are biologically predisposed to learn to be afraid of snakes faster than other predators or really other stimuli because the snake is their number one predator. The amygdala plays a key role in associating emotions with specific situations. Um, if damaged, the emotion, the emotion is not associated with the situation. Um, so fear response is even diminished because if you make an association with that specific stimuli, you understand more and it will increase. So let's talk more specifically about anger, what makes us angry. And there's a lot of different factors. So anything from misdeeds of a loved one to aches and pains, right? So is it good or bad? Chronic hostility is linked to heart disease. Like if you're always angry, that's gonna cause your sympathetic nervous system to kind of be in overdrive. Controlled expression of anger can be good. It's better than pent up anger or irrational anger. It can lead a person to talk over the offense rather than ignore and stew about it. The catharsis hypothesis, you should make sure you have this as a vocabulary term written down, releasing aggressive energy relieves aggressive urges. That's what the hypothesis said. Research has shown that expressing anger can be temporarily calming, but it usually does not clear the feeling of anger. So we need to be careful with how much rage is expressed and how often. So this expression can lead to more hostility and cruelty due to reinforcement we experience. And that expression of anger can become a habitual behavior and that, man, it feels good to express this, so I'm just going to do it more often. That's not really the purpose. So how should we deal with anger? Waiting until physical arousal calms. you got to give it a minute. Calm down first physiologically and then respond uh, by expressing grievances in a manner that promotes reconciliation, not hostility. So forgiveness in the end can reduce anger and therefore its physical symptoms. So on the other end, let's talk about happiness. People who are happy, perceive the world as safer, make decisions more easily, easily, more cooperative, and live happier, more satisfied lives. And we should talk about the feel good, do good phenomenon. This is when people tend to be helpful to others when they're in a good mood. Like it makes sense, like I'm feeling great today. Oh, you need help, let me help you. It's just feel good, do good. Um, daily events generally only cause moods to be altered for that day. Even significant bad or negative events seldom destroy happiness permanently. Um, so adaptation level phenomenon says, it's our tendency to judge various stimuli as relative to those we have previously experienced. So we adjust our neutral levels and then notice and react to variations up or down from those levels. So let's say you win the lottery tomorrow. According to this principle of adaptation level phenomenon, you would have a sear of happiness initially, but then you would adapt to the new lifestyle and come to consider it as your new normal and therefore would require something even better to give you a surge of happiness. Like, okay, so like what's better than that? I mean, I'm sure there's other things, but is there anything more stimulating than that? So maybe you shouldn't be too happy because then other things won't make you as happy. I guess that's what that's saying. So what makes a person happy? It seems to be determined partially by genes as well as how we approach the world, which I guess could be considered culturally, socially, but also in that you're conditioned and how do you per perceive the world.